Hello there. So from 17 once again. This is my Kingdom Hearts 2 critical mode walkthrough. We are moving towards the Land of Dragons, and we have another one of the obligatory gummy ship sections. So, you might remember a little sequence kind of similar to this in the past game, where when you traversed the new worlds, you had to you were forced to play a mini game, a slow ass shooting mini game, where you were in a gummy ship made of Lego, and you were shooting stuff. And they lasted a little bit too long, they were a little bit too dull, and for the most it was slow and uninteresting. Well, they completely changed that in Kingdom Hearts 2, and they turned it into what you're watching now, which I think is, is one of the most fun minigames you can do between levels. I think it's really, 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 really good. And it's the type of thing that's so good that you find yourself coming back once you've got a better ship to get the better scores and the better medal ranks and get all the items. And If you're a trophy hunter, you're going to have to do that anyway, because that's one of the... Uh, one of the stipulations for a trophy, I believe. But it's these kind of moments that make me just mourn that games don't really swip, swap genres or embellish upon their own gameplay enough. Because how many games have you played in the last five years where all you've done is the one single categorised piece of gameplay that that game is known for? And don't get me wrong, there can always be deviations, but it's always the same formula. You very rarely get a game that is a third-person action RPG that immediately turns up in turns into a shmup akin to something like Afterburner or Space Harrier. You, you don't see it. And there's a good reason for it, because they're two completely different genres, but it doesn't mean it can't be done and it doesn't mean it can't work, because this is a, a great example of just something silly, fun and irreverent that you can do when you're not doing the main things that splits up the game. And this game did it fantastically, and the only other titles I really see doing this kind of stuff is is the games that, you know, Hideki Kamiya makes, because he likes these kind of shooters, so you see those sections in his games. And it's funny because he is the enthusiast of those titles, yet I think a lot of the parts of his games where he puts them in aren't the best games. And obviously I'm not talking about the games as a whole, I'm talking about the way that you use those mechanics in those games. I, I think this is better than any of the shooting sections in in Kamiya's games. And it's got nothing to do with, you know, fan service or fanboyism. It's just, I find this really fun and really entertaining. And I find a lot of the ones in games like The Wonderful 101 and Bayonetta to be kind of repetitive and annoying. And there's a very fine line between great gameplay and you know, very average gameplay, and I think this definitely sides on the side of being great. And it's this type of stuff I'd love to see more of, and we just don't. And, and I think that's a massive shame. But here we are in the Land of Dragons. A lot of people are mentioning how good the soundtrack is for this game. Well, if your ears are, you know, are well versed in the Kingdom Hearts 2 soundtrack, you should be noticing a lot of differences, because this has been completely re-recorded. The, the, the original version of these music songs, I don't believe were done with an orchestra. Uh, so I think a lot of this is just... It sounds so much more powerful now, so much more just epic on every scale. Some of them don't, but most of them do. And for a lot of people who are noticing the soundtrack, you're noticing it more, maybe because you're not used to what it used to sound like. And the old sound was, was a lot more like BGM midified than, than the new ones. Not to say it was bad, it was just a sign of the times. You know, they weren't embellishing that much too much on as far as, you know, orchestral pieces went. And now they are, of course, because technology advances and, and all that great stuff. But for the people who aren't spotting the differences and are kind of confused, the best area to try it on is in Port Royal, because the original version of that Pirates of the Caribbean song was essentially like a MIDI drum loop from a keyboard, and now it's just pretty much as close to the movie as you can get without being sued even though, you know, I think Disney owns it. <laughs> but this is, of course, the land of Mulan. We are playing with, I think it's his name, Ping? I can't remember, I know that probably sounds really racist to, to just assume a Chinese person is Ping, but it might be, actually. It's been a long time since I saw Mulan, I, I watched it in the cinemas. I, I think it's a really good film. But this world is very simple. There's only one part of it I found even remotely tricky, and that is those uh, centaur men who they get armor when they attack, and if they start attacking, you can't get away from it if you're too close, and it does massive damage, and you can't interrupt it, because once he starts, he will finish, because he's like that fucking dude on Mastermind, 
and they have a lot of life, so they're, they're an enemy where when you don't have a roll and you don't have a quick run away, they're an absolute pain in the ass to fight unless you get the first hit, and they can kill you in seconds, and it's, it's kind of tricky, but you can parry them if you're confident with your guard. Uh, it's just, you've got to be careful, like everything on this game. You die really quickly on critical, but it's kind of a good thing, because it teaches you how to play the game. And what we're doing here in the camp is you have to complete these, complete these three objectives for the general dude, the love interest in Mulan, I don't know his name. And they just generally involve doing the things you're going to be doing a lot in this game. The first one, well, all of them, I think, are to do with morale, which... Morale here is a tangible thing, which is kind of interesting, and you have to pick it up, because the more dragon spheres you have, the more morale you have, and once you get the bar to the top, you win. But I always find it really interesting that on Kingdom Hearts 2, they took the most common Heartless, the Shadow, I think it's called this one, and they made it an absolute nightmare to fight. They made it just annoying, because all it does is run away from you, and it's really small and tough to hit. And a lot of the times with Sora on this game, and with, with all the Kingdom Hearts, you're at the mercy of what the computer wants to do, because there's not enough control over how you fight. And I just, I'll never understand it, to, to be perfectly honest. And I'm hoping that when Kingdom Hearts 3 comes out, there's a lot more control over that. But instead, you, you're relying on the computer to do its job, and sometimes it doesn't. And a great example is when you get the ability to close distance with an attack. It's not something you input, so you can do it from any distance. It's something the game does, and the game has to assess it, and of course if you're out of the range that the game wants it to work in, it doesn't work. So it's not like you can just cover an entire field dashing forward with a strike to, to cover time really quickly. You have to run into range, then do the attack, and hope you're in the right range for it to trigger, which is more about experience and, and that gut feeling than anything else. But if you're not in range, Sora will just do a standard attack that's slow as piss and has big recovery. <laughs> and it's just that thing of, it slows the game down. And it's the same with the aerial stuff. When you're in the air, Sora can do two attacks. He can do a jump and a normal attack, which is slow and unwieldy, or he can do the kind of quicker, aggressive jump attack, which um, I was having problems getting with Roxas at the beginning. And after I recorded this, I've been listening to some speedrunners who play this game a lot. And they are people who, they know everything about the game because they have to. That's what they're doing. They're, they're mastering it to a level where they just know how everything works. And whereas I thought there was a trick to getting the jump attack to come out reliably as Roxas, turns out that it's probably a glitch, where every so often the detection just doesn't make it happen, and it slows down the progression of the attack. Uh, this is the, the tough uh, centaur dude. Uh, I like to spam a lot of magic at him from a distance and hope that the team kills him. When you get close, you can try and wait for his first attack and parry. Some of them are multi-hit, so you want to be careful. But there was the, the guard, there's the stun, you can get another quick combo in there, and uh, here come a few other ones. But they, they'd show you just a lot of things that I thought were, were parts of the game you just kind of had to accept. Because when I played this when I was younger, I didn't really play it on a high level. I mean, sure, I beat all the secret bosses and I beat it on proud difficulty, but... I didn't really play it like I would play a game now because I wasn't looking at it the same way. I was just, you know, it's Disney characters, it's Squaresoft, or Square Enix, sorry. And I was just getting in there and having fun and I wasn't really complicating it too much. So I didn't really know too much of the nuance. But the, the guard that you just saw me do then. In some of the early videos, people are mentioning how you can guard attacks on, on certain attack, uh, certain enemies, like the assassins, I believe they're called. The guys in the ground, and it gets them out of the ground. Well, when I was first recording the early parts of this guide, I wasn't too trustful of the, the block, because I wasn't too good with it, and I don't like it at all. I've seen a few comments on the video saying that the block in this game is, is really good and useful, and it is, but it's still a bad block. And it's bad for two reasons. One, because it has big recovery that you can't cancel, and two, because it has big wind-up that you can't cancel. So the start and the end of the entire attack are a pain in the ass, and the middle bit's great. <laughs> and I'm having a similar problem at this moment in time with, with Birth by Sleep. And uh, when I say problem here, guys, it doesn't mean it's inherently bad. It's that I find it to be inferior to other systems they could have used. You can see footage of people using it perfectly. People who have learnt when to do it, how to do it, and have that timing ingrained. Just like anything else, if you're willing to put the time in, you can make it look really good. And as with pretty much every mechanic that wasn't quote, completely favourable to all people, which is every mechanic ever made, 
There's going to be people who have played with it so long that they don't realise that it isn't as good as it could be because they're compensating for it with their ability. And, you know, you can have blinders on to these facts because you're so in love with the game or you're so used to it that to you, you don't even notice you're doing it and then to somebody else, it's just this glaring big hole. And it's, it's one of the more interesting, you know, facets of analysing games. But on Birth by Sleep... It has this fantastic combat system and I love it to bits because it takes what they've done in these first two games and it makes it something truly special and the guard is really quick in that game but attacks still have mad recovery so getting the guard out sometimes just doesn't happen and there's, there's moments when I think it might be my controller even though and I didn't have any problems when I was playing this game and there's a lot of square inputs in this but because Birth by Sleep's a little faster and a little bit more responsive than this game. There's times when I feel like I'm dropping inputs. And if it's not the controller dropping inputs, it has to be the recovery frames not letting me put an, an input in. And there are moments where I know an attack is coming, I'm not attacking, I'm waiting for Aqua to stop or, or to do a move, and she doesn't do it. And any other move she would have done, but the guard just doesn't seem to come out. So the only thing I can think of is that after certain animations, there is a a lot of recovery where you can't do anything and uh, be careful here by the way I got instantly killed on this this next spawn of enemies I had full life I don't know how it happened it just cut to Sora making his little cum noise and that slow motion white screen it was something did it couldn't tell you what I assume it was maybe a dash attack by this this mage creature but keep on focusing on the enemies smash the rocks all of this can be uh, mitigated speed-wise by using the drives that you're going to see me neglect for most of the game. Now, one thing the speedrunners have definitely shown me when I've been watching them and slash listening to them while I was recording Birth by Sleep is just how useful the, the drive gorge is for certain activities. And uh, some of those strategies, folks, if you're struggling with this game and, you know, you're watching what I'm doing and it's not working for you or... Maybe you're just looking for a different strategy. Just look up a speedrun. These are people who have got this game down to a science. And like some of the fights, I, I, I was stuck on Roxas for about an hour and a half. Because it was just one of those fights where if he did a certain attack instead of another attack, I would die because he killed me so quickly. And I couldn't get the guard time down. And originally, after a while, I kind of learned it a bit better. And I learned how to respond in those moments. And I was like, that's, that's a really tough fight compared to everything else in the game. And then I watched somebody do it. And of course, they, they knew a loop. And I kind of had a loop on my plan that I was doing. But it wasn't like this. This was a loop where they knew exactly what he would do. And they just guarded it and punished him. And then they, they somehow managed to get Ars Arcanum to hit every hit. And I don't know if it's because they were attacking him from behind or if it's because the way they set it up. But they had this setup where he couldn't get out of it. And they just kept on hitting him. And they'd, they'd let him do his thing. They'd punish him again, they'd guard, then they'd do a combo, then they'd go into Ars Arcanum, and it'd just wreck him. Absolutely destroyed the guy, it ruined him. And it was really fascinating to watch, because when I was playing, I couldn't get combos to land. The guy was just countering them. And there's a revenge mechanic in this game that the bosses have, where if you take off too much life too quickly, they will get hyper armor, and then they'll do a counter-attack that does really big damage. And for the most, I didn't have too much issue because I could use it to my you know, advantage. I could hurt them to a certain amount and then I could get away before it triggered that automatic reflex. But with Roxas, completely different story. You know, I got to the point where I was letting him out of combos where I could have continued for maybe one or two hits because I was terrified of the repose that would come. And I got it to a point where I could almost keep him juggled and I could keep resetting him on the ground. And as soon as it seemed like it was a sure fire strategy, he countered it and killed me and immediately put fear in me to do that move again. So I had to change with, did I keep him on the ground with a finisher? Did I launch him and, and things like that. So I was having a pretty visceral fight with this boss. So to see him destroyed in an almost guaranteed fashion was, not only was it awesome to watch, it was also inspiring because it made me look at the way I'd been fighting him a little bit different. Because when a boss is countering you perfectly and it doesn't seem like you can get him in attacks and it just comes off as really cheap, it can put a dampener on your spirits towards the game because you know this mechanic exists and you know there's not really much you can do. But watching these people circumvent it was really fascinating and I'm going to go back to this game. I don't know when. It might be soon, it might be later because I'm in a big Kingdom Hearts mood. All depends on if people want to watch or if people want more videos and there's going to be a lot between this and Birth by Sleep. 
But I'm going to do a level 1 playthrough on critical mode, and uh, I'm going to really look into just getting down the uses for the drives and, and some of these more interesting strategies that people are using. And I should probably point out some of the things that I learned that I, I perhaps didn't know because I, I completely don't use them at all. Uh, the first one, which is a little bit more obvious to, to people that have played, and it's one of the things I did know, when you activate the drive mode, I think it fills your magic. So it's one of those things where you can use this as an advantage to, to get a second magic bar should you need it. Obviously, I think the drive modes as well, uh, some of them have the ability to give you life and uh, things of that nature. I prefer the limits, personally, because they give you invulnerability frames and you can use those to your advantage, but I'm going to be using those in this game, so I'm not going to talk too much until we use them. But a second one is, if you leave the planet while in drive mode, it will completely refill the bar all the way up. Very useful thing to know if you're going to be using it, and why would you not? It's incredibly powerful. It gets very difficult fights to be very easy if you know what you're doing. And then additionally, each of the drives is leveled up a different way, and you want to look into how they're leveled up, so level them up quickly should you want to use them. And one of the reasons why you want to use them is, of course, to get the passive abilities that they give you. And in my playthrough, I'm going to get the roll, I'm going to get the high jump, and I'm going to get, I believe... Uh, the air recovery or something like that, but I do not get the fast run which is a shame because I want to experiment with that because it looks pretty good and I can't really remember ever using it. As I said, I didn't use the drives. <laughs> didn't like them. It's just one of those stigmas. And it's a stigma that carries across to Birth by Sleep. Because when I played it on an emulator, I changed the controls to map the camera to my analogue and it meant that certain things didn't work so well. One of them was the shot lock, so I never used it. Another one that I didn't really understand, didn't really want to use, was the dynamic, or the dimensional link, sorry, which I beat critical mode as both Terra and Ventus, never using shot lock and never using those dimension links. Not because I was doing a restriction run or some kind of challenge run, it was just because A, I, I thought the dimension links were like drives and thus I had no interest in them, and I couldn't use the shot lock should I want to because of the emulated control issues. So when I play it now and I, and I have this ability to use this stuff, I'm not doing it and I'm forgetting to do it and it's this really funny circumstance of I have access to all these tools and I'm just fighting dudes <laughs> and I'm having a ton of fun and it is a strategy that will work but I need to make it aware to people as I run around here that I'm only not using them because it's a personal thing it's not you shouldn't use them I'm not taking you know the the superior elitist perspective of anyone who uses X is a bitch, because it's really not about that, it's, it's about what you're comfortable and what you enjoy. And I need to talk about what just happened there too, I got down to low life, which is going to happen a lot in this guide, you, you die very quick on this difficulty, and th the game makes a noise, it makes a, a, a siren, klaxon, horrific noise, and I can't even begin to wish that there was an option to turn it off. And I understand it completely, and I'm sure a lot of people do. It makes a noise to tell you you're in danger, and to increase the tension, heighten the, the, the feeling of the fight. However, I absolutely hate it. I hate everything about it. In Birth by Sleep, when it happens, I will use the Dimension Link to get a heal just to stop the noise. It's one of those things that just winds me up. And it's the same when games have something happening to the screen. In an action game where you need to be paying attention and you need to react really quickly, the last thing you want is an obnoxious noise and something fucking with your visibility. Yet this is features that are, are evolving to be part and, you know, archetypes of these games. And it's really sad. Because I'm the guy that I don't want any of that. If I've got low life, let me see the low life. I have this amazing ability as a human being to look, it, to look up sorry, in the upper left and see the bar. That's why it's there. It's the information to tell me I'm not doing so well and I'm very close to game over. But they put these things in that might sound like a good idea and some people might really love, but I don't. And customization is, is so good in some games and I wish other games had more of it. Like, Third Strike, winding me up, Third Strike is. There is no option to turn down the music or anything. So I can't record awesome sound clips or, or sound effects 
because all I can hear is the ridiculous soundtrack of bloody Jamaican hip hop nonsense that that game has almost all the time. Like new wave fucking folklore hip hop grind car. I don't even know what it is. Like trip hop swing car or something daft. But essentially the music is not bad. It's just it's all the time. There's no way to get that game with no fucking music so I can hear the parry sound and I can take the parry sound and apply it to other videos. Or, because I've got this series that I want to do with Dudley where I parry stupid stuff and then afterwards I throw the rose at him and I say gutter trash. But I can't get a really nice clear gutter trash sound clip to do it on. Because all the time in the background it's like bees in my head or whatever that fucking song is. And it's really annoying, but this is Kingdom Hearts, and this is a pretty s weird fight, which... Something that's worth noting on this version of the game, I haven't had any frame rate issues, and I remember in the original Kingdom Hearts that the frame rate did drop in certain circumstances, so this game is a hell of a lot smoother. But it does suffer because of it, I believe, and it suffers in its load times. The load times on this game are worse than the PlayStation 2 version, and... There's a part of me that wants to wonder why, but I know why. It's because this one is in high definition and it runs at a better frame rate. Which might not be entirely true, I don't know if some of the Japanese versions or the final mix runs at a better frame rate, because I never played them outside of the emulator and of course, emulators can have the best frame rate should you choose to. But there's some definite performance issues in the game, and it is a bit of a shame to see them, but it's just the way it is. And this is explaining the limit command to me. Which is always fun when the game gives you tutorials when you've been playing it for a few hours. <laughs> but you're going to notice that I don't take many partners from the world with me. It was a conscious choice. However, there are strategies that I used to use that you're not going to see me using. And thus it's going to make some of the fights a little bit more tricky. So I'm going to try and tell you all the strategies that I normally would use in, the, in part of the ones that you're going to see me using. The only real big one is against the boss in Beast's World. That boss is a pain in the ass, and when he's invisible, if you take Beast into that fight, you can use a Beast's Limit to help you weaken the boss and get him out of the cloak and then immediately punish him with a reaction command or a good combo and kill him pretty quickly. Because I wanted to do something different from when I last played, I decided not to take Beast into that fight, and that fight became a lot more tricky than I wanted it to be. And it also introduces you to a new mechanic, which I have to speak about because it, it goes in part part and parcel with just how easy this game really is when you think about it. So in early videos I mentioned that you can mash your way through this game and a few people uh, didn't think that was true. I just don't understand how anyone can say that. It seems to me like people are trying to give the game more credit than it's worth because you can mash your way through this entire game. You can mash your way through Sephiroth and he's meant to be the hardest thing in the game. This version does have critical mode which is much more difficult but guaranteed I could hand this off to one of my nephews and they could get through this game quite easily without Evan really knowing any advanced techniques at all. The same can be said with most games so it's not to put the game down it's just unfortunately the reaction commands make the game easy and the the way the, the combat is programmed makes mashing very successful. One of the things I've never understood is they lowered the difficulty, they got rid of a lot of the evasive nature of the commands a la the roll and, and you couldn't roll in, in the original version for people who don't know they brought it back in a drive command which you can get in this game but the emphasis was more on reaction commands and drive forms I assume uh, somebody left an interesting comment saying on this this game they thought that they wanted you to guard more that's why there was no roll but I still don't like the guard I don't think it's one of those things where this is one of those games where the difference between an advanced player and, a, and, a, and everybody else is guarding pretty much universally and even so you can get through this entire game without guarding and you can probably get through this entire game without attacking you wouldn't want to but it's it's true that you could and the mechanic I'm going to talk about I'm going to have to save because the video ended prematurely but thank you very much for watching guys I will continue it after this next boss because this is going to be a short video because this guy's a bitch but thanks for watching and you take care now.